It's found in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 to 15, on page numbers 998 and 999 in the Bibles on your chairs. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with them, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing, and let our per- people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need, and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in, in the faith. Grace be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, for those of you who have not met me yet, my name is Stephen Coppenrath. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Foothill. Uh, Pastor Chris and his family are on a few days of, of well-deserved vacation, so he's asked me to fill the pulpit today, and it's my honor to do so. Um, as you just heard, we're taking a break from Mark this morning, and we're going to be in Titus 3, and so I don't expect you guys all to know where Titus is, so if you still need some time getting there, go for that. Uh, but before we get there, let me start off in uh, just a word of prayer. So just bow your heads with me. God, I thank you for this morning and this opportunity to to open your word. And and Lord, uh, we don't take that for granted. Uh, We're so grateful to be able to be in a place, uh, to live in a nation that allows us to do so on Sunday morning. God, I pray that you would help us as uh, we look through this passage. God, I pray that uh, instantly there would be application for all of our lives, wherever we're at this morning. Um, And and I pray that as we walk away from here, Lord, that uh, your word would just be planted deep in our heart. Uh, not because of me or this message, but because it's your word. Uh, and that's the character and nature of your word. We love you, God. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, uh, about a year ago, I was, I was driving around and um, obeying the, the laws of our great land. And I get pulled over. And uh, there was a time in my life when getting pulled over would have just struck up a bunch of fear in my heart. Right, like I, that's just something that kind of freaked me out. I was nervous about it, and I'm not exactly sure what to do. How do I play it cool here? And fortunately for me, I, I feel like those days are kind of gone. And so uh, I get pulled over, and and the first thing I'm kind of doing is just wondering. I wonder, I wonder what happened. I don't, I don't think I was speeding or anything like that. And so I'm I'm, I'm sitting there waiting, and the officer comes up to me, knocks on the window, roll it down, and and uh, he says, do, "Do you realize you were driving pretty fast back there?" And I said. Uh, I'm sorry, officer, I actually didn't realize that. I didn't, I didn't realize I was speeding. Um, but thank you, I, I know now. Um, and uh, he says, can I see your, your proof of insurance and, and driver's license? So I hand that stuff over to him, and he looks at it for a minute, and he says, do, do you realize your driver's license is expired? I'm like, oh, shoot, you know, I, I didn't know that, actually. I had no idea. He said, yeah, it expired three days ago. And so, um, you, you know that driver's license you get? Uh, at some point, and it's good for like 45 years, and, and you go back to the DMV and you feel like you have no idea what to do because you haven't been in the DMV so long. This was that driver's license, and so he takes that information from me. He says, I'll be right back. And so I'm sitting there. I'm a little riled now because I didn't know my driver's license was expired, and so I'm sitting there, and you know, a few minutes pass. I, I, I realize he's writing a ticket right now. This isn't good, right? I, I didn't realize this was going to end this way, and so I'm, I'm kind of racking my brain, thinking through my options. How do I get 
on this guy's good side because I don't want a ticket, right? Should I name drop someone? Do I know someone who's a cop? Like, does that even matter? Like, should I fake crying? Like, what's the, what's the protocol here? Because I, I don't want a ticket. And so I'm thinking through my options and the entire time um, I'm doing so. And so the, the officer comes back a lot sooner than I thought. So the, the best thing I can muster up is, is just this, you know, I just appreciate what you guys do out here. Um, <laughs> You know, you guys are just out here keeping the streets safe, and I, I just appreciate that. He just kind of looks at me funny, right? He's like, here's your ticket. And, um, and so uh, first ticket in about six years, and remember, this is about a year ago. And so normally, if I were to get a ticket, um, normal protocol for me would just to pay the ticket and go to traffic court and just be done with it. But I decide for some reason, this time, I wanted to see Lady Justice just kind of do her thing. So I wanted to go through the process and because I don't really feel like I was speeding. And so I wanted to fight the ticket and just kind of see what happened. And I've heard people kind of had, you know, some, some mixed results with that. And so I decide that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to fight my ticket. And so for those of you who have never fought a ticket before, what you're basically signing up for is kind of a long process that for me took about a year. And so the first thing you have to do is go to your arraignment. And so last Thursday, um, last Thursday, I finally get to my arraignment, and uh, it's this simple court appointment where you're basically supposed to enter a plea, you know, guilty, not guilty, or no contest. It's supposed to be the simple thing. And so I pull up into uh, the, the courthouse parking lot, and the genius that designed this courthouse um, had 12 spaces, and they were all, all filled. And so I, I'm driving around for a little bit, about five minutes goes by, I finally find some, um, some street parking about two blocks down the street. And at, at this point, I'm kind of hustling a little bit because I'm like, man, I don't want to be late. I was on time and now I might be late. And so I start chugging my way to um, what I think is the front doors of the courthouse, which in fact, it's actually the back doors of the courthouse. And so I have to walk through the rose bushes and the, the garden bed, you know, I'll just try to get to the, the front doors. I, I get in, go through security, go through um, the metal detector, and for a minute I have to stop because I, I, I have no idea where to go, right? Because I didn't, I didn't bring anything, right? I, just, I, I didn't bring my ticket, I didn't, bring, I didn't go online and look, I just kind of went there and hoped for the best, I guess. I don't know what I was thinking. And so I start wandering around a little bit, and I mean, this place is like, the, the signs are like this small, right? And I have no idea where to go. And, um, I finally see this little sign that says traffic violations, and so I, I get in that line. There's about six people in that line. Ten minutes goes by, finally get to the front, and this, this lady says, you know, how, how can I help you? What do you need? And I say, uh, well, uh, I'm supposed to be here for traffic court. It's my first time, and I'm giving her all this information she doesn't need, right? And um, so she confirms my name. She confirms my address. She takes a, a copy of my driver's license. And after about five minutes of standing there with her, kind of just doing some paperwork stuff, she finally says to me, you're actually supposed to be in the room next door, uh, courtroom uh, B. And I, I take my stuff and I say, well, thank you very much. And kind of a little frustrated because I felt like my time was just wasted a little bit. And so I head over to courtroom B and in courtroom B, I open the door and the room is completely packed. There's probably like a hundred people in this room, um, all these, idiots trying to find their tickets, I guess, like me. Um, and at this point, I'm like, man, maybe I should have just paid my ticket because I, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And the whole time, I'm trying to say to myself, have a good attitude. Just, you know, keep it, keep it cool here. And so since I'm late, since the room's packed, the only place that I can uh, find a seat is the front row on the right of the Spanish-speaking area. So what that means is that I'm standing here, directly right in front of me is this woman who's calling out uh, the bailiff's instructions in Spanish, like right to my face. And I'm like confused, I don't, I don't know Spanish by the way, uh, hopefully that was clear. Um, and I, I, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on right here. So they, they do the roll call, they, they swear you in, and again, I'm like, I should have just paid the ticket. So I'm sitting there in my little seat, because I, I hate little seats, they're always little, playing the shoulder game, right? When you, you don't want to touch people's shoulders, so you're like leaning forward a little bit, and, and then they go forward. Uh, so I'm getting sweaty, um, not because I'm nervous, I just get sweaty. You can ask my wife about that. And you just have to wait, and it's waiting and waiting. It takes about four hours to see all these people through their, their trials and arraignments, and none of you guys are gonna ever fight a ticket after this, right? Um, and the whole process, all to just stand in front of the judge 
for about 10 seconds to say, not guilty, I guess, because I've, I've been here all day for this. Um, and the bailiff hands me a court date, and I, I didn't think it would take that long. And here's, here's what's frustrating. I, I was studying Titus 3 all week for this message. And the whole point of, of Titus chapter 3, the whole, the whole idea behind it is something very different than, than my attitude. Um, in my heart, while I was going through this day, as I was trying to find a parking space, as I was uh, in the wrong line for 15 minutes, as I'm sitting in, in traffic court, the, the thought that keeps coming to my brain, the, the thing that I just want to almost say out loud to people is that everyone around me is stupid. Right? I just, uh, this person's bad at their job, and I don't, this system is inefficient, and I don't like the way this is handled. Uh, I deserve for this to be different. I have better things to do with my time. And uh, man, hopefully I'm not just throwing myself out there. Hopefully you guys are, uh, have been there with me, but I just have these feelings of superiority and entitlement that this should be different for me. And the message of Titus 3 is all about the way that those who have been redeemed by Christ are supposed to interact with those who do not yet know him. And, and as I was studying this, it just hit me. I mean, to say it another way, it's basically about how the church is supposed to be in the world, how we're supposed to interact with unbelievers. And so uh, going back to Titus really quickly, I'm not sure how, how much you've studied Titus, but Titus is, he, he's basically a church planner. And he's establishing this healthy church, trying to establish this healthy church in the region of Crete. And so Paul is writing this letter to him of encouragement and instruction and support, trying to tell him, hey, look, this is the, these are the marks of a healthy church. As you're getting your ministry going, this is what a healthy church looks like. And so kind of follow these guidelines. And so we're not going to read the whole, the whole book. It's a small book. Read it sometime. But basically the gist of chapters 1 through 3. Chapter 1, it starts off saying, look, these are the qualifications of, of healthy leadership. This is what a healthy leader should look like in your church. Chapter two, he says, because of the gospel, because what has happened in your heart, uh, teach sound doctrine. Make sure you have your doctrine straight. And then chapter three, where we're in today, he says, as the church goes out into regular life, as you rub elbows, as you bump shoulders with people who, who aren't believers, this is how people should know you. And so as is the case with almost every sermon that I give, um, a passage like this will somehow apply right to me. Because I, I'm, I'm the guy, you can ask my close friends, ask the people on staff uh, at, at Foothill, I'm the person who, who always kind of has the critique, right? I always have the, the thing, well this could be done a little bit better, right? And, and this could be a little bit, a, a little bit more well run. And, and so I tend to be a little uh, sharp and sometimes rebuke a little bit more often than I should. And, and there's a, a time for that, Absolutely, there's a time for that. And Titus says, though, uh, in chapter 2, that, that's what happens between believers and other believers. But in chapter 3, he, he kind of turns the page a little bit, and he says, look, we're no longer talking about how believers relate with other believers. We're talking about how believers relate with non-believers. And that changes our tone. And if you let it this morning, this could be a transformational way uh, a difference in, in your thinking a little bit. Uh, I, I think that we as Christians can miss the point when it comes to our interactions with culture sometimes. Um, man, I, I remember, you know, not long ago, I was at APU, and those of you students who are here, I mean, the APU bubble, we talk about that all the time. And, and unfortunately, if you allow that to continue to happen in your life, you don't have to get too much older, you, you're still in it. I mean, you still have your Christian friends, your Christian clubs, you hang out with your church friends, and you, you always kind of surround yourselves with people who are like-minded and have the same values as you. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I, I would contend that if you only hang out with, non, uh, with Christians, um, you're limiting yourself a little bit. And, and so we must remember that while holiness is important, while keeping ourselves sacred, keep our hearts sacred is important, uh, we must be the light by which the city sees. We have to put ourselves in a, in a place, uh, give ourselves the opportunity to be out in our communities, uh, being involved in sports leagues. Man, I've, I don't know how many times our staff has, has fielded questions about, you know, when are you gonna start this program, 
right? When are you gonna start you know, this basketball league or this thing for my kids? And well, when is this gonna happen? And we simply don't do it that way because we believe that we should be out in our communities affecting culture. We need to be out joining uh, the, the Pee Wee Sports Leagues and being involved in our neighbors' lives. That's the way, I, I believe that's a biblical model. And so how else will people see who God is if we just kind of have our own little, uh, our own little clubs and, and Christian leagues? We're reading this book right now as a staff. It's called, What is the Mission of the Church? It's a great book. I would recommend it. It's by Kevin DeYoung and Greg Gilbert. And it's a great way to remind us um, what the purpose of the church is supposed to be about. And so and at the end of chapter five, they say this, it also becomes clear once again why the primary task of Christians in this age with reference to the kingdom is not to build it or establish it or even build for it, but rather to be witnesses to this representing suffering forgiving king. He goes on and says this, you see the disciples were not simply to sit and enjoy the fact that all authority now belonged to King Jesus. They were to go and proclaim that fact to a dark world that had no idea of that reality. They were to witness, not establish, not usher in, not even build for the kingdom of God, but bear witness to it. And, and so for us this morning, in, in other words, uh, does, does the entirety of your life bear witness to what God is doing in the kingdom in Glendora, in, in this area. And so this is kind of our context for chapter three. And so if, if you have your Bibles, uh, go to verse one. Um, Paul begins verse one and two, uh, basically saying, or remind the church uh, of these things. And what he gives us is a, a small list. Um, and, and this isn't an exhaustive list. This isn't something that is a full list, but it's simply a way for us to, to stop and see how we are to interact with others around us. Uh, Because the question isn't whether or not we interact, right? We all go out to dinner. We all have that waitress that, you know, just needs to do better at her job or whatever. And the question is, is how do we interact? In what spirit do we interact? At the DMV, at traffic court, with your supervisor, with your employee, online, on Facebook. How do you interact with unbelievers? So Paul's going to say that the the church should have a, a marked difference in the way that we interact. And, and this is what sets us apart. And so I'm gonna list these seven qualities. You can underline them if you'd like to in verses one and two in your Bibles. Um, so submission to authority, obedience, readiness to do good, speaking evil of nobody, avoiding quarrels, being gentle, showing perfect courtesy to all people. So this is the small list he gives us, um, just to kind of check our hearts against. And so just run this list through your heart. Think about it for a second. Uh, First of all, submission to authority. Submission to authority. Do you see authority as a blessing and as a covering? Or or do you have what is called an authority problem? Man, I I think there's this kind of misconception sometimes about, about, well, you know, teenagers have authority problems, right? They picture a 17-year-old punk kid, you know, who's who's got these family issues and or whatever and and they have an authority problem and the reality is is i've met lots of adults and you probably have too that have authority problems i mean they're 30 40 50 60 years old and they still haven't got over the fact that they don't like people telling them what to do um i have people like that in my family and so we we need to recognize that we are all under authority it's just the reality of things and so when you get pulled over for speeding right what's your attitude like I mean, well, are you an extension of God's love? Are you polite? Are, are you giving courtesy to the officer or are you passive aggressive? Are, are you like, here's, here's the stuff, just whatever. I mean, the, the crazy thing here is Paul is writing this to Titus. And again, Titus is a church planner in Crete and Crete is not this, this you know, God-fearing utopia. Crete has, has immorality, Crete's got uh, pagan worship. Uh, almost every level of government in Crete is corrupt. And, and this is the area that needs a church, and this is why Titus went there. But at the same time, Paul says, look, I understand your context. This is still the command. We're supposed to uh, submit to authority. The church needs to understand that. Number two, he goes on and says this, the church is obedient. 
The church is obedient. The disposition of our heart is one of obedience. Uh, so simply put, are, are we humbly submitting ourselves to the law of the land? Is this something that's important to us? And here's where we wanna go with this. Whenever we hear stuff about uh, being obedient to government, well, what about the opportunity to, to challenge government? Right? Isn't that my right as an American? I mean, it, what about the opportunity to, to have conflict and disagree? And, and that's where we want to go. That's where our hearts want to go. Instead of simply saying, yes, Lord. Uh, but, but fortunately for us, the Lord will go there with us. And he'll say, look, if you want to confront, if you want to have conflict, if there's something that's worth fighting for here, let's do it. I'll go there with you. But that does not give you the right to be a punk while you do it. It doesn't give you the right to, to have all this attitude and write all this hate mail and write emails that just, would, you would never say those things in person, but because you're standing in front of your computer, you, you'd feel free just to type that stuff up. There has to be a marked difference in the way that we challenge authority if we're gonna do that. Uh, and we all know it, especially you guys as parents. There's, there's, a, way, there's a way that we can uh, gear up and get excited and aggressive about, about challenging authority, and there's a way to humbly submit and yet points some things out. And we all know the difference when we see it. Number three, he continues on and says, the church, believers are ready. We're prepared to do good. We're prepared to do good. So the question uh, for, for this one is, is, are you helpful? Are you a contributing citizen? Are you, are you one who adds more than, than you take? Are you somebody who is in your neighborhood and people know you for doing good? Um, when I read this verse, I think of the movie, uh, It's a Wonderful Life. And I'm kind of giving the plot away here, but if you haven't seen the movie yet, oh well, sorry. Um, it's a, that's a really old movie. And It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey has this chance, this, this window of opportunity to see what life is like if he was never born, if he was never around, if he wasn't a part of what was happening, if he wasn't in town. And so what happens in this town is the bank gets removed and Pottersville starts to grow and flourish. And, and Pottersville, it represents everything that is corrupt and greedy and sinful. And so George Bailey sees that, man, if I was here, my life could have had an impact. And, and so he, he, he comes back together with his family and at the end of the movie, you know it rejoices. The town has changed. Ever, it's, a, it's a great end of a movie. And I would contend that Foothill Church, this, this should be our role in our community as well. And we've talked about this before on a Sunday. Chris talks about this all the time, but it, the question, if Foothill Church were to be removed from this neighborhood, would there even be an impact? Man, I hope so. If, if we were to leave, would, would Wickham High School uh, know that we were gone? I would hope so. Uh, and so just take that principle and apply it to your own life. Just think about that for a minute. Just think, uh, if you were to have to get up and move today, would, would your neighbors even notice? Would it make a dent? Um, man, it's just your cubicle, right? Your office space, the, the sphere of influence that you have. If you were to leave, if you were to take off, would people be bummed out by that? Would they say, man, I miss that guy, I miss that girl, they did good. I appreciated them being around here. And Jesus is saying, through the Apostle Paul here, is that this is what I want my church to be like. Uh, I want my church to be a place that makes an impact and, and that really showcases my glory. Um, see, the city in which we live, the city cannot see, the city is blind because it's filled with people who do not know Christ. And so we have to change our perspective from being takers and being people who, uh, who think that something is owed to us and are looking forward to services and people servicing us and my family and my needs to realizing we are the light by which the city will see. And if we make that connection, then God gets his glory. And that's what it's all about. Number four is this. The next attribute is speaking evil of no one. Speaking evil of no one. This one's hard for me. Um, partly because I tend to be very, very sarcastic and, um, and sometimes I, I can be hurtful with my words. Absolutely. Uh, but do you build up with your speech? You know, even your enemies, even people that you just straight up disagree with, right? I don't agree with you. 
Um, but are you, still, are you still someone who speaks evil of no one? Or as James says, are you this bipolar Christian that curses people with the same mouth that you sing songs about Jesus with? Right? Is this you? So consider how you use your words when it comes to especially controversial topics. Man, we got an election year coming up. Man, and I just pray that, that our church would be known for, for, for praying for these candidates. Right? This is something that would be important to us. So our government, our president, have you expended more time uh, just tearing people down, you know, in authority over us, as opposed to being a blessing and praying for them and, and speaking, uh, not speaking evil of them? And I believe that this is the black eye of the church in a lot of ways. And how many times have, have we, have, have some of us torn down Obama and joined in with every single talking head on TV? And there's nothing distinctively Christian about what we're saying. And I'm not saying you, you agree with him. I'm not, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about policy. We're not talking about agreeing with what's going on. But how do you disagree? What is the spirit in which you disagree? Are you angry? Why are you angry? And so God has put these men and women in place um, and our role is to humbly submit to them. We challenge ungodliness, absolutely. We're not doormats. But at the same time, as we challenge, we, we, we do so as a blessing. We, we speak evil of no one. Number five, avoiding quarrels. Uh, simply put, do we build bridges to our enemies? Do we make it easy for forgiveness to happen? You know, how is our church known? As we speak about this in, in Titus 3, um, looking at this, the, the mark, the, the heart of a believer is one that has been changed inwardly by grace, right? We, we've, we've sinned, we've fallen short, and God has blessed us. He's given us grace, but it can't stop there. It can't just all sit right here, all inside of me. It has to extend outwardly as well. And so by avoiding quarrels, we're talking about making it easy for forgiveness to happen. And this should be the mark of a believer. Number six, he goes on and says, be gentle. Be gentle. Are you gentle? Is your disposition being aggressive or is it gentleness? Another way to look at this would be, are you an easy person to be around? For some, for some of you guys, that might be an easy answer. Um, Number seven is this, finally, is, is showing courtesy to all people. Showing courtesy to all people. Now, I'm, unlike Pastor Chris, I was never a lawyer, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that verse has no loopholes in it, right? Showing perfect courtesy to all people. And this is kind of the, the point that Paul is driving home here in, in Titus 3. Um, so, so he takes this list we just went through, numbers one through seven. And he starts to say, consider who you were. Consider who you were. Consider what God has done in your life, the good work he's done. And as those things collide, there is a new reality. And, and that simply plays out in the way that we treat one another. Um, verse three. Paul says, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, Slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. So what he's doing here is he's describing the sinful condition. He's describing my position before I was in Christ. And so as we realize what God has done in our life, again, this changes the way that we interact with other people. We recognize that we are the image bearers of God. We understand that everyone has an errant worth because of that. And so... That includes the broken, the, the inconsiderate, the rude people that we interact with on shopping trips. Uh, it, it, can, it, it covers all of that. And in light of that, in light of who we once were, our sinful nature previously, we are mandated by a holy God to treat everyone with courtesy. This isn't an optional thing. And so even if they don't deserve kindness and don't deserve respect, we are to offer kindness and respect to that person. And so it's, it's, not about, it's not about them, right? It's not about that waiter or that customer service rep. It's not about if they could do their job better, if that system was better. It's about us. It's about our hearts. Uh, and this is what Paul's saying. It's not about them. It's about us. Think of yourself. 
Consider your own life, where you've been, what God has done in your life, and we have no option other than to treat those people with kindness and respect. And so when you're on hold with Verizon for two hours, which I've been, man, it's, I've been there, and, and they're just trying to do their job, and, and maybe they could do it a little bit better, but maybe they've had a rough day. It, when the t- telemarketer calls you, and you just, you know, you just wanna be rude, um, what this is saying is we're supposed to treat them with perfect courtesy. Oh, we're not to be condescending, we're not to be rude. So chapter three, again, it's a reminder that the church is the light. The church is the light by which the city will see. Um, if there's nothing distinctively Christian about the way that we interact with other people, people won't see what's happening in our hearts. This isn't a case for legalism. This isn't checklist Christianity. This is simply saying, look, no one's gonna know what's happened in your heart if if you don't act differently. Your love for God should be obvious. Man, some of you guys are are really, really nice people. Um, I've met a lot of you, you're you're, you're nice folks, okay? Um, And some of you guys have worked really hard to to make it that way. Um, You have these well-crafted, really controlled, shaped life, so you're, you're never out of control, you were, you've always been kind of a good person, right? You never rebelled. But even for this person, even for some of you who are sitting in this room, uh, verse four, Paul's gonna tear that down as well. He's gonna say, look, you had no shot. You have no, no right to stand on this pedestal and look down at people, because if, if God hadn't come in and done for you what you could not do for yourself, then you would still be in your sinful condition you'd still be without Christ. And so don't forget this. Don't lose sight. This is kind of another part of what Paul's saying. Don't forget. Don't forget. Don't lose sight of what's happened. And not so you can feel guilty again and say, oh man, I I stink, right? It's not about that. It's so we can, it shapes the way that we view God. Uh, The idea of of remembrance theology is woven throughout scripture. Um, You know, looking back at, at Abraham and Moses and Noah, they all would build these, these huge monuments, well huge as in like six feet, whatever, uh, large monuments to, to remember what God had done in their life. Um, they would build these monuments as, as a way for people to, to point to and say, I remember when God came through. I remember when God did that for me. Um, in our hymn, Come Thou Fount, it talks about raising my Ebenezer. It's the same idea, raising this monument of remembrance. In the book of Exodus, the Israelites, they remember every year when the angel of death came and they were supposed to paint their doorposts with blood. And, and simply as, as the angel of death passed by, that this is what they remember every year at the Passover meal. And so they remember, they remember uh, through feasts, through sacrifices, they would handle the animals in such a way that they would remember. In the New Testament, Jesus said, eat of this bread, drink of this cup in remembrance of me. And we're gonna do this later in communion. And again, we remember what God had done. We remember our sin, and not in an unhealthy way, but in a way we recall and say, I I remember what I was like, and God changed me. And so don't lose sight of who you were before Christ. Let's look at verse four. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And so really quickly, if you look at verses three and then verse four, there's there's a stark contrast in the way this, this is written. In verse three, the subject, the active agent here is us. Right, we're doing what we're doing. We're in our sin. We're the ones being described. And in verse four, it turns and God steps up into the forefront and it's all about him. It's all about his saving works. And so there's this contrast here where, where you and I in verse three are stuck in the pit. As, in, as it says in Psalm 40, he comes out and he pulls us out of the muck and mire, sets his feet on new ground, puts a, a song in our heart. And this is the gospel. This is what the gospel does for us, what God does in us. And because of the gospel, we consider others differently. We look to to be helpful. And so what is the gospel? Uh, What is the gospel? You see, the gospel isn't isn't just this um, story, right? It's not this formula 
that gets written down and gets passed along through the centuries, and it's like, okay, do this, do that, you know, secret handshake, here's a badge, you're in the club. It, it's, that's not the God. The gospel is alive. It's alive today. It motivates us. It, it does a number of things. So the first thing, it, it motivates a changed heart inwardly. It motivates a changed heart inwardly that begins over time as you mature, as you become sanctified, that extends outwardly. Um, You become fundamentally different. Man, God changes everything about you. You have different cravings. You have different tastes. You want different things. And this is what the, the gospel does for us. It provides motivation. The gospel is also encouragement. The gospel encourages us. It says, look at where you were, and, and look what God has done. And, and even though God did that initial saving action, we, we still have a long way to go. And according to Philippians 1, he's going to be there to give us strength, to give us encouragement, and that encourages us as well. And so the gospel motivates, it encourages, and the gospel produces compassion in the heart of believers. It produces compassion. So what that means for us is as I look into our community and I see all these people around us who are not saved, who do not know Christ, um, instead of welling up pride in my heart where I can just look down at them and say, man, you guys are, are out of the club. You didn't make it. It, it allows me to have compassion uh, from no good of my own, Right? This is what the gospel does. It gives us compassion. And so the heart of the believer, it shouldn't run to judgment, but to, to compassion first. Uh, well, what about people getting what they deserve, right? People should know that they were wrong because they, they just have to know. And, and guys, I, I understand that, um, but conviction happens through the gospel as, as the spirit begins to confront those people. That's not our job. Our job is to be compassionate. The gospel also tears down self-righteousness. Again, we talked about this all morning, but it's this idea that there was something that I did, right? I brought something great to the table. I brought something that that God couldn't have done on his own, and so because of that, I can be self-righteous. I have self-worth, and the gospel completely just crushes that and says, look, you had no shot at it before me. And so as as I'm sitting getting my ticket, Right, as I'm in the wrong line for 10 minutes, as I'm in this kind of system of, of trying to get this figured out, um, and I have these unbelievably self-centered thoughts, right, of superiority, and this shouldn't be happening to me, and I'm, you know, I have better things to do. The gospel just confronts me and says, look, look, man, you, you were dead in your sin. You can sit here for a little while. Uh, and so the gospel confronts that personally, but it confronts us as a church as well. In verse four, it says, but when the goodness, loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. And so he's talking to the church here that we have no righteous work as a church that can impress God. And so the gospel produces encouragement and motivation. It produces compassion in the heart of a believer. It knocks down the pedestal of of self-righteousness. It also enables us to forgive. Enables us to forgive. And, you know, we, we talk about this all the time here at Fiddle Church, but do you, do you realize that we've been forgiven a much, and we owe much? Man, God could have destroyed us. It was completely within his rights to do so, but he saved us. He washed us clean. The filth is cleansed off. We're new people. And so it brings up this imagery in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? He's a new creation, Right? The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And so, again, I'm fundamentally different. I'm a different person. And because of that difference, I am asked to forgive people, right? We can't hold on to anger. We can't hold on to bitterness. That's not even within my my arsenal as a Christian. It's not a possibility for us to do that. Look, I understand why lost, sinful people cannot forgive it makes sense to me. Because they, they, have, they have no other outlet. That person did wrong, and they have to be held accountable. And so I'm going to remind them every time I see them that they screwed up. This is how it works in the world. But for us as Christians, we don't have that option. We've been forgiven of much, and so we have to make the way and say, look, I forgive you. We let it go. 
And so finally, the gospel, the last thing it does for us is it allows us to lay down our lives. Verse six. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Just read verse 7 one more time again with me. Being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so what I like about this is is Paul kind of takes a a little bit of a, a pause. He's been instructing, he's been teaching Titus, he's been showing him, look, these are the, this is the marks of a healthy church. But he, he stops here in verse seven really slightly and just and helps him with a little bit of encouragement. He says, remember, man, you guys are, you're, you're an heir to the kingdom of God. When you die, when, when God takes you, when I've breathed my last breath, I wake up in the presence of the king. And this is great news for us. And so this affects the way that that I, my, my priority is completely different. I can hold money differently because it, it doesn't just end with my life. I, I have, an, I have a, a seal of redemption in my heart that one day I'm gonna be in heaven with him. And so this, this completely allow, this allows us to think differently. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And so this is the invitation of Christ to the church to finally experience life through our death. Um, see, it, it's, death isn't something we talk about a lot as Christians. Um, it's not something that kind of just comes up in conversation. Um, for those of you guys who are married, uh, m- maybe you'll know what I'm talking about here, but have you guys ever noticed, it's funny the stuff that you and your spouse will talk about when no one's around, right? Some of the, the most, um, amusing and random parts of my day um, are when Katie and I lay down in bed, we're getting ready to go to sleep, and we just talk about our day. Just the funny conversations we've had and the things that we've, we've seen. It's like, oh, did you notice this? And we'll just kind of talk about things, whether it be you know, TV or the kids or the Lakers, how they blew it in the playoffs. I'm still bitter about that. Um, but I, I don't know about how you guys, but how you guys feel about this, but I've, I've found the longer we've been married, we're on, we're on year eight right now, and the easier for me it's become to just bring up random conversation starters. So, so one night I'm like, hey babe, so tomorrow on my way to work, if I were just to drop dead, what's the plan for you? <laughs> She's like, oh well, you know, I'd probably be pretty upset, but there'd be, I'd have to go, I don't, I don't know, what, why are we talking about this right now? No, I'm just curious, you know, if I were just to die, right, and just, you know, for a massive heart attack, I don't, I don't know. Um, what, what would you do tomorrow? Like, what would be your plan tomorrow? Oh, well, okay, and so she's talking about what she might do, and eventually I find out she, she, wants, to, she wants to be like a missionary in Africa or something, so she's got her plan already all, all set. <laughs> but some of you guys think that's a little bit morbid, but we, we've had that conversation. And I, I love how these random thoughts sometimes uh, between, between close people, um, they press us into having um, great conversations, right? Um, these, these little things, and so conversations that start like that kind of end with, you know, babe, I just wanna make something clear to you. Katie, I, I love you, I love our kids, I would do anything for you guys, and if something were to happen to me, if something were to happen suddenly where, where God would just take me, first of all, understand that, that I'm with him in glory, and that's, that's a great thing. And you will be given uh, an extra helping of grace. And even though it's hard to imagine, it, it's gonna be okay. And guys, the reason I bring this up is because it's important that we talk about death and dying and our future glory from time to time. Because what it does is it allows us to release our tight grasps on our lives. A lot of us have so much held up in our hands that we just don't wanna let go of. And when we talk about the fact that we're not gonna live forever, that we're gonna one day pass away and things are gonna change for everybody, that allows us to to live differently today. It allows our priorities to, to have a different direction. It means that the fears I have can be put to rest because I'm a son, you're a daughter. It's, it's great news for us. 
And so in light of that, I, I can live differently. And so we as the church, again, we're, we're the light by which the city will see by, by the different way that we, we think in these areas. And so Paul's serious about this. In verse nine, go back to, to verse nine. Uh, he says this, if people come in and stir discord, start dividing the church, start inviting the church into foolish genealogies and dissensions. And basically he's talking about if people come into the church and get your church off a missional focus, off the original vision that it was intended for, then here's how you deal with that person. Very simply, it's, it's, it's gracious, but it's, it's quick. So you, you warn them once, you warn them twice, and then you kick them out. That's simply how you deal with it. Because Paul's trying to protect Titus's young ministry from having any hiccups and having these people that will, will come in and, and disrupt what's happening at the church. And so he wants to see Titus doing ministry for a long time. Uh, I just want to end with this encouragement to you guys. At verse 13, I know we're jumping around a little bit, but he says this in verse 13, do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. Okay, so if you're like me, um, you didn't know that Zenos existed, right? Other than, you know, Zena the warrior princess. That's not who they're talking about right here, okay? Uh, Zenos, all we know about Zenos is that he was a lawyer. He's just mentioned here in the New Testament, um, and that's it. And so, but here, here's what's jumped off the page for me as I, as I read this. Um, Paul finds it, uh, important to bring up the fact that he's a lawyer. Why does he do that? Um, well, first of all, Zenos is obviously woven into the ministry of what's happening in Crete. Uh, Titus's church with Paul, the ministry that's going on, he's a big part of what's happening. And so the fact that he brings up that he's a lawyer, th- this is just my opinion, I-, I believe that Paul is reminding us that you don't have to be a professional minister of the gospel, you don't have to be a professional pastor to be involved in ministry. Uh, you don't have to be somebody who's been to seminary or had all this experience. And so Zenos is simply working along with people. His position as a lawyer, it's not at conflict with the kingdom. In fact, he uses it as a pedestal for the kingdom. And so just think about your own lives because I realize that right now I'm speaking to a group of people who for the most part are not pastors, are not ministers. You're, you're out in the world, you're, you're dealing with real work issues, your plumbers, your doctors, your, your pharmaceutical reps, your students, your, your business people, and you all have different things going on, your teachers, and, and what God is saying to you is that your life, what you're doing, where you're at right now is by design. You're supposed to be where you are because as a teacher, you have an opportunity that I would never have. You know, as a business person, you're in a completely different world. I would never even be able to interact with those people. But you have the opportunity to be the light to those people. Um, so go be a lawyer, go be a doctor, but do it with, with the perspective that you will give God glory through your job and that you will represent God as a citizen of light. Richard Niebuhr wrote about uh, revival and renewal, and he, he says this, He says, the great Christian revolutions come not by the discovery of something that was not known before. They happen when somebody takes radically something that was always there. And so just as we close, just think about what God has done in your heart. Man, some of you guys have amazing testimonies. We've had the opportunity to see testimonies on the screen before. There's some on our website. Um, There's some in our, our family room. We don't just throw those up there because we think those people are are good looking or multi-ethnic or whatever. I mean, that's not the point. We we really believe in, in, in celebrating what God has done. And so as you think about what God has done in your life, as you think about what God's done in this church, he's transformed this church over the past five years, it's been amazing. And what, what Richard Niebuhr is saying here is that if, if that isn't awe-inspiring to you, if that doesn't well up some kind of worship in your heart, if that doesn't change you radically and make you wanna go do something, then for us as Christians, that means either you're not saved or you don't understand the full message of the gospel. See, a revival, it it always starts with a person first and then it infiltrates into the community. And so my hope for us is that we would radically take the gospel take the word we've heard today, and it would, ex- it would help us to extend grace to other people, that we would live differently because of it. And so as we go from this place, after worship's ended, 
as we picked up our kids, as you guys head out to lunch and kind of, you know, real life started, and you have that bad service at the restaurant, uh, later on when you're shopping this weekend and you just have just this run-in with a, a rude person, I mean, I, I hope you remember this stuff. Uh, if you get pulled over from here to home, I'm not saying that's gonna happen, hopefully that's not a prophetic word or anything, but <laughs> man, think about that. How are you interacting? What is the spirit in which you interact? Remember that we are citizens of light. We are drawing people to the king. We're ambassadors of Christ. This is our role in the kingdom of God. Let's pray to that end. Let's bow our heads. God, I just thank you for for your word, for how it challenges us, how it refines our hearts. God, I pray that as uh, as we look forward to this new week, um, God, I pray that we would just take this week. A lot of times we think think so big. We want to take this whole year and and, and do this and do that and have all these goals, but I pray that this week we would live differently in light of, of who you are and what you've done in our lives. God, that we would truly represent you well, not just with our Christian friends, not just with our, our kids and our, our parents and our, our spouses, God, but with the people that have no affiliation with us who don't know you at all and who are separated. And God, I pray that that would create compassion in our hearts, that we would see people differently. God, we love you. We thank you for this time. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, hey, um, we're going to spend some time in worship right now, as we normally do. And so I just want to encourage you guys, if you haven't filled out um, connection cards or offering envelopes, take this time to do that. Um, Also, we have communion. um, These stations up here, and there's instructions on the screen behind me. So, Lindsay.